So I'd like to walk you through a guided imagery exercise. So what I'd like for you to do is sit back in your seats, relax, and picture in your mind a place that you really like to visit, a special place for you. Then I'd like for you to close your eyes and go there. While you're at your special place, I'd like for you to figure out what you smell. What do you hear? Walk around in your special place. What is it that you see? How do those attributes make you feel? And lastly, I'd like for you to take a mental picture of that special place. Now open your eyes. How many of you in this room had a water feature in your special place? Please raise your hand. Look around the room. The majority of folks in here had a water feature as part of their special place. And what that should tell you is water quality is important to all of us. But the question is, how do we monitor and measure water quality? Well, it turns out humans have used animals to measure environmental health for hundreds of years. Perhaps you've heard the old phrase, the canary in the coal mine. This phrase was coined in 1890 by a Scottish physiologist named John Scott Haldane whose research was on the effects of toxic gases on humans. And he knew long ago that animals were far more sensitive to environmental change than people. And he, he termed those animals sentinel species. And he worked a lot with coal miners and in coal mines and how those, the effects of our carbon monoxide affected people. So the, the miners would then take a canary, this very small bird, down in the coal mines with them. As a bird, Canaries have very high metabolisms and require a lot of oxygen. So they could, I, they could uh, detect, as those carbon monoxide levels began to, to rise, alert that to the miners, and they could evacuate the mines and thus save thousands and thousands of human lives. So the canary absolutely is a sentinel for environmental air quality. But do we have an analog in the aquatic world? And it turns out that we do. It's not a canary in the coal mine, it's a salamander in the stream. And the species I'd like to introduce you to today is the eastern hellbender. The eastern hellbender is North America's largest salamander. It can reach lengths of up to 24 inches, so two feet long for a single salamander. It is indeed called a giant salamander. Now, I give hellbender talks all over the country, and every time I give that statistics, people really just don't appreciate how impressive this species is. So as a special treat for this audience today, I brought one for you, and I'd like to show it to you. So give me just a second to, to grab a hold of him, and here he is. Now, obviously, this is not a real Eastern Hellbender. Uh, I had to bring a plaster replica, uh, but I did want to show this to you to show you just how impressive this particular species is. I'd like to direct your attention to the ge geographic distribution map on the right of the screen. And you can see in blue is where the eastern hellbender is located throughout the eastern United States, especially along the Appalachian Mountain region. But pay particular attention to Indiana and in south central Indiana. You might see a little blue sliver of blue on the south central portion of the state. That is the only place hellbenders occur in Indiana. And in fact, hellbenders are an endangered species in Indiana. And the only river they occur in is called the Blue River. So what's going on with hellbenders? Well, they rely on very fast-flowing, clear waters. And there are two reasons why we think hellbenders are declining, not only in Indiana, but across the entire geographic distribution. And one of those would be the influx of nutrients into the aquatic system. And the second factor is an increase in sedimentation in the rivers and streams where these hellbenders live. So what is it about the natural history or the biology of eastern hellbenders that make them an important sentinel species for environmental water quality. Well, first, like all amphibians, hellbenders have permeable skin, which means they readily absorb things in their environment. Good things, like oxygen. So they absorb oxygen through their skin, which allows them to breathe underwater. But it also allows them to absorb harmful things, like pollutants or harmful chemicals that are in the environment. The second factor that makes a hellbender, a really great sentinel species for water quality, is their life cycle. They're fully aquatic. And I'll direct your attention to the top of the slide. These small little yellow marble-sized uh, structures, those are hellbender eggs. So females will lay about 300 eggs about every year, and males will guard those for about 60 days. 
those, after those eggs hatch, they're about an inch, an inch and a half long. That's how they, this large, giant salamander starts life out about an inch and a half long with little plume-like external gills from which it absorbs oxygen. And they rely on these, these fast-flowing, clear streams because they like to hide in the interstitial spaces of gravel along the stream bed. And that's how they elude predators. So if we have high sediment loads that fills up those interstitial spaces, hellbenders have no place to hide when they're really little and susceptible to predation. After two years, they will readily absorb those external gills and a partial transformation and become juveniles. And they'll stay juveniles for an additional five years. So it takes seven years for hellbenders to reach sexual maturity. But once they reach that point, they can reproduce for an additional 25 years. So that third feature that makes them a great indicator of environmental water quality is the fact that they're long-lived. These salamanders can live 30 years in the wild, which is an incredibly long time for an amphibian to live. So if you have a long-lived species that is declining throughout a large portion of its range, that's usually an indicator that there's something going on with our water quality and certainly cause for concern. Now, oftentimes, when I give hellbender talks, I get asked the same one or two questions. And the very first question I'm oftentimes asked is, Rod, have you always been interested in hellbenders? Well, if you remember, uh, in Indiana, we have one river called the Blue River. And my story began in back when I was 16 years old. I took my very first canoe trip in the Blue River. I canoed over some of the best hellbender habitat in the state, over some of the best hellbender populations in the state. But I had no idea at that time because my 16-year-old girlfriend was also in the canoe. And I was distracted. Uh, and my 16-year-old girlfriend, unfortunately, was a terrible canoer, and we spent more time out of the canoe because she kept capsizing it than we did in the canoe. Now, despite her lack of canoeing skills, I actually went on to marry that 16-year-old girl. She's in the fourth row right now, and we celebrate our 21st wedding anniversary this June. Thank you. So clearly that experience had a profound effect on my life. And so when my son turned 16 last year, I took him to the Blue River, and we kayaked on the exact same stretch of river that I kayaked on back in 1990 because I wanted him to experience those deep blue waters. I wanted him to experience those rocky outcrops and the, the, the borders of the river laden with beautiful trees. And that really brings me to the second reason, a second question that I'm oftentimes asked is, what can I do as a person to ensure that the water quality remains high for the next generation? And how, what can we do to improve water quality for aquatic species like the Eastern Hellbender? Well, there's really three things I'm gonna to talk to you about today, and they're quite simple. And the first really re revolves around water quality, or water, water conservation. So in the United States, we use an estimated 9.3 trillion gallons of water annually. Nine billions of gallons of water on a daily basis, largely for landscape irrigation, which includes things like watering our lawn, watering our garden, and watering our flowers. And so that's a lot of water that we're pulling from the tap. And so there are some simple practices that we can adopt to minimize our water usage from the tap. And one of those is simply purchasing a rain barrel. And you can get those from your soil and water conservation district. You can go to your county extension office, oftentimes purchase those, many times at a reduced rate. And it's very simple. You take that rain barrel and you install it underneath of your downspout on your house. So during rainfall events, your roof collects the water, it runs down your downspout and right into the rain barrel. You can attach a water hose at the very bottom of the rain barrel, and you have 55 gallons of free water to use for your lawn, your garden, and your flowers. So a great way to, mi to minimize the water that we're, that we're using out of our tap. Now, many of us probably also have lawns that we like to maintain, or perhaps you know someone that has a lawn that they like to maintain, and we, as a culture, like to have very well-manicured lawns. And that's okay, but there's two problems that are sometimes associated with maintaining a lawn. Uh, one is sometimes folks will over-fertilize their lawn, over-apply the fertilizer that's necessary, and two, they use fertilizer with high levels of phosphorus. Again, it's getting back to those nutrients that get into the stream. So what happens when you over-fertilize and use fertilizer with phosphorus is during rainfall events, those excess nutrients will, will run out of your lawn, down the sidewalk, into the storm drain, and are directly diverted into the rivers and streams. Once they're in the rivers and streams, they cause vegetation to grow at unprecedented rates. When that vegetation dies, that decomposition changes the chemistry of the water. The chemistry of the water with things like oxygen. And remember, hellbenders need oxygen in the water to breathe, so it can have a direct effect on the aquatic life living there. 
So I'll just charge you to think about uh, the application of fertilizer this spring and try to use phosphate-free uh, fertilizer as the spring is approaching and you guys start thinking about maintaining your lawns this spring. The last practice I'm going to talk about really revolves around agriculture. Now, I suspect many of the folks in here are not farmers, uh, but you can't think about farming in Indiana without talking about it because it has such a huge footprint across the landscape of the state of Indiana. And one of, the, one of the practices that I'm really excited about farmers adopting are cover crops. Many of you have probably driven around the Midwest in the fall and seen farmers either harvesting corn or soybeans, and then they immediately go back into the fields and they'll plant another crop in the, in the sort of off season. And those cover crops serve two really valuable purposes. The first is when those crops begin to grow and those roots go down in the ground, they're readily absorbing nutrients. Those same nutrients that the farmers apply, those fertilizers on those crops in the spring and summer, are now being absorbed by those plants and not seeping down through the groundwater and again going directly into the rivers and streams where aquatic salamanders live. So they're being held by the plants. The second important feature is those plants themselves are helping to stabilize the soil. And it's really important that the soil stays where it belongs, in the field and not in the rivers and streams. Because remember, that heavy set, those soil erosion causes all those soil particles to go into the river and streams, fills in those interstitial spaces where juvenile hellbenders live and where the aquatic prey, things like macroinvertebrates and crayfish, live where the hellbenders need to eat. So it really doesn't matter whether or not you live in a subdivision or a 2,000 acre family farm. There's really simple things that we can do, and if we do so collectively, can have a profound impact on the, on the water quality at a large scale. Now, when I started the presentation, I asked you guys to share with, with, a, with the group your special place and whether or not your place had a water feature. So I thought I would share my special place with you, and I suspect it is not a surprise that at the centerpiece of my landscape is a water feature. And this is actually a picture of a stream behind my house, and this is a place that I go to quite frequently. Uh, when life gets a little hectic, uh, when I need to recharge my batteries or perhaps just reflect a little bit, I go down to the edge of the creek, lean my back up against a tree, listen to the riffles, uh, the water run over the, the rocks and the riffles, and sort of wash my stress right downstream um, into the neighbor's yard. <laughs> but one of the things I want to challenge everybody to do today is think about what it is that you can do so that when you look at landscapes like this, the landscapes in reality can be just as pristine as those that you have in your mind. If we do those things, we can certainly help the hellbender and forever ensure that they remain the salamanders in the stream. Thank you.